Dylan, nice to see you. We've had a fascinating chat of the weekend and Dylan is going to be sharing his experience, 20 years of experience of dealing with viticulture, particularly his knowledge of old vines, which is extensive and fascinating. And as we're about to find out, the conclusions from his research are not what you might expect and also not what we've been told. 20 years, he looks a lot younger than that, doesn't he, Dylan? It must be all that good coffee you're drinking there in the Barossa Valley. He started out pruning vineyards. He now runs his own viticultural consultancy. He's worked with some of the top names in, uh, in Australia. Some of you who've done your Master of Wine uh, or are studying for it will be familiar with Di Davidson's book. Di Davidson's book is very good on planting a vineyard. He's also worked with Dr. Peter Dry. He now runs his own consultancy, which he's been running since 2008. And I just looked at the list of some of the places he's worked and they're not the usual suspects, really. He's worked with Man of War on, on Wahiki Island, an amazing site, with Mac Forbes, who I think is one of the best producers in the Yarra Valley. Also, he took himself off with his family to Spain uh, and worked in Catalonia with his spelt. Consults now still are for people in, in Australia, obviously, where he's based, but also in Italy and Spain, along with my good friend Sandra Bravo, who is a bit of an old vine specialist too. So, Dylan, what we're going to do, we've decided, is because there's a fair bit of certainly for me, scientific heavy lifting going on here. That's quite detailed stuff. Is Dylan's going to divide his presentation into three bits. And rather than interrupt him while he's talking, we're going to let him present part one, then part two, and then part three. And after each part, Dylan will say that's the end of part one, and we'll then have a, uh, a time for questions. So please put your questions into the chat box. I'm now going to shut up uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, pass over to Dylan. Dylan, lovely to see you. Can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Go, man. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Tim. No, it's great to be with you. And it's great. To, thanks to Sarah for the invitation and also um, Dr. Jamie Good, also, who, um, who put my name up to do this. So let me just share my screen. Slightly professional. Right here. Now, have you got that, Tim? I can see it, yeah. Great, then I think everyone can see it. So um, what I'm gonna do, like Tim said, is I'm gonna present this in three sections and I'm gonna try and keep it reasonably reasonably simple. It's gonna get a bit scientific at times, but I'll, I'll hopefully keep it um, conversational because I know we've got a broad audience base. So what I'm going to, the crux of my presentation will be based on my PhD research, which I spent quite some time thinking about old vines and researching old vines, which led me to meet many amazing people all over the world. And anyone that knows me knows that I can talk the leg off the chair about any vines, but then we put old in front as a prefix and I'll, I'll go on and on. So Tim, if we're running behind time, just... I'll do my best to tick, tick you off. Excellent. Now, I'll continue to refer to this work as work that we did because I did have an amazing group of PhD supervisors and people helping me through this. It was my PhD, but it was I see it as collaborative because without them, I couldn't have done it. So let's just see if we can go to the second slide. Here we go. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that Australia is home to some very old vines. Despite being a new world country, Australia's got a wine growing history that dates back to the 1700s, with the first wine being exported, uh, planting and growing and producing, of course, in the 1820s, and commercial winemaking really started to, to take off around the 1840s. Most states in the, the southern half of Australia are home to some old vines. There's old vines in the Swan region in Perth or in Western Australia. There's some old vines in indeed in the Hunter and also in Western Victoria. But the greatest concentration would be in South Australia. And that's where most of my presentation will be about or will be based in the Barossa Valley. But there are also old vines in the Clare Valley and McLaren Vale. So how did vines in the new world get to become so old? Well, I think if we look at where they're based, it's quite dry and quite warm. And also a key thing is there's no phylloxera in Australia, in South Australia, I should say. At this point in time, South Australia remains phylloxera free. If you can see, I'm going to use my cursor a lot, so I hope that works. There is phylloxera in Victoria, but 
biosecurity or strict control on the border to South Australia has to this day prevented phylloxera from entering. So we have a lot of old vines in the Barossa Valley and South Australia, in fact, that are um, still existing on their own roots. Now, the Barossa Valley as a wine region is very proud of their old vine heritage and they've put together a charter, which I borrowed from the here, um, Barossa Grape and Wine here, which it's, it's a way that they can communicate how old vines are and with some consistency to the market. So starting at 35 years of age, we can go down here. For example, vines that are 70 years or more are called survivor vines. And within the Barossa Valley alone, there's 240 hectares. In the, when we get to centenarian vines, so greater than 100 years of age, there's 137 hectares in the Barossa. And of the oldest vines in the Barossa Valley, the ancestor vines, is a class above 125 years of planted age. There's around 30 hectares. Now, the Barossa Valley has is home to what's believed to be the oldest producing vines of Cabernet Sauvignon, Gurinash, Shiraz, Mataro and Semillon, all which can fit into this 125 year plus ancestor vine category with some vines almost 180 years old, which is pretty extraordinary. Can so, you just tell us which is the oldest vine? I think you, to you told me that, didn't you? The oldest. Freedom Block at Langmile in Tanunda would be the oldest, I think the oldest vines and they're Shiraz vines which would be 1843 approximately planted. And it's interesting because is... you were saying to me that there's actually a paper trail there. So you, 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 we know that those vines were planted then. Exactly. I mean, you can't just go, hey, I've got an old vineyard and look at how gnarly it is. You need to have some, some evidence of planting, whether it's a newspaper clipping or I know some people have used photos of a, a wedding party in a newspaper or a wine <laughs> that's been submitted or change of ownership. But yeah, there is a paper trail to, to verify just how old that site is. And yeah, some uh, old... yeah, a lot of old vines in Chile, people say, oh, my great, great grandfather knew somebody who planted this and therefore it must have been planted in 1812. But that's not proof, is it? So, exactly. Yeah. And without, without, you know, a rapid, easy way to, yeah. to cut them off and do some dendrochronology or something like that, it's not quite old enough to carbon date. We have to trust trust the records and yeah. in countries that the records aren't that well kept it is a challenge yeah anyway sorry to interrupt keep going no, fascinating no problem. yeah back on track yeah. so how do they get so old i guess the first thing that i mentioned was phylloxera that's got to be one reason because these vines weren't under the pressure of the root louse in order that required them to be pulled out and replanted on rootstocks so the vine that was planted and some of the vines that were planted were the first in the country still exist today. I'm going to ignore the social and economic drivers like fashion and things like that. If we look at the oldest vineyards that are around in the Barossa in particular, they're usually within a straight, a straight football kick of a uh, ephemeral stream or a watercourse, and they're often planted at very wide densities. So back in the early or mid 1800s, there wasn't such a thing as a drip tube and irrigation was by bucket only so the wider you can plant the vines then the more soil that they can exploit and less intervine competition there is now this has led to the interesting observation that these vines because they're widely planted have a lot of space to grow so this is this is an old vineyard this is over 150 year old shiraz you can see the trunk has split in two but the vine is still growing if you believe it or not, you know, the sap flow theory of sap flowing up the outside of the trunk, here we can see it because the bark is still shedding and it's alive. Now, if this was in a tightly spaced vineyard, there would have been some pressure to cut back this vine to rejuvenate it or to make it occupy its own little box or space. Whereas here it's allowed to grow and it occupies a very large area. The last point I make is that where we have the oldest vines, they're often found in dry and arid areas, which suit wine growing for one, but they also, I think, slow the, the degradation of, of uh, wood rotting fungi and bacteria. So a lot of, a lot of old dead wood can persist. Mm 
Here's another example of a vineyard that's maybe 120. It's, it was planted to a very low trellis here. So if we can picture the permanent cordon being established some 90 years ago, then the, the cordon or the spur positions get higher and higher. So instead of cutting them back and making a large wound for rejuvenation, they've simply raised the cordon height once, twice, three, four, and here there's even a, a metal pole extension. So this vine has been allowed to get higher and higher and higher, avoiding being cutting back, which has allowed it to, to live to be this, this age. Also, many, there are many bush vines which are planted on wide spacing. And now a bush vine is allowed, if it's planted widely, it can also occupy a much larger space. So these vines here, this is actually in my vineyard, and you can see that the trellis disappeared decades ago. And the arms, which were the permanent cordons, have drooped down. And these spur positions, which some are up to a metre tall, have been allowed to uh, continue to grow. And if we remember back to the first conference when Marco said that old vines need permanent living wood and they need to build on that living wood to avoid being cutting back, cut, it, cut back, this is a clear example of that. And being own rooted, where it's laid down and touches the ground, it's also been able to root and reroot to exploit even more soil area for nutrition and for water. So, Tim, I don't know if there's any questions backing up after that, but before I like launch into the really meaty section. So that's that's, that, 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 that's part one, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I've got one question, which is in areas uh, in Australia where that have had phylloxera, how have the vines survived if they've been grafted? Did you know of any old, really old grafted vines that were grafted just after phylloxera arrived and grafted onto uh, American rootstocks? I think that the time delay of phylloxera coming down here and then the European reconstitution on rootstocks mm. meant that our grafted vines will not be as old as grafted vines in Europe. So we're still, I think, exploring the upper end of how that Franken vine can live beyond 100, 120 years. So the, interestingly, the main driver for vines in Australia to be grafted on rootstock before phylloxera was an issue was actually for nematode resistance yeah. in sandy sites. Yeah, but, but you're saying in theory, there's no reason why a grafted vine shouldn't last as long as an own rooted vine? I don't know. It's undergone a major surgical operation. In theory, yes, but it is still a hybrid vine. And if we look back to the, the images of those trunks, and imagine that is just one one being that's that's genetically identical. It yeah. hasn't ever been joined together, so it's been able to crack open and it stays living. So I don't know. I think the jury's the jury's out. But if, if, um, somebody's a couple of questions. I mean, we'll come on to the second one in a minute. But just Jaco Engelbrecht, my good friend from South Africa, another distinguished viticulturist, uh, he said South Africa has grafted vines dating back to 1900. That most mm -hmm. was grafted onto Jacquet, though, which has some vinifera blood in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so those, I mean, those would probably be the, some, was certainly the oldest, would you say the oldest grafted vines in the New World? Probably. Uh, probably in the New yeah. World, yes, because they, uh, South Africa had an earlier driver to graft. I know where I was working in, in the region of Emporda in, in Catalonia, yeah. there was some very old vines that were grafted because phylloxera entered over Col de Fornel. So it was one of the first places where they started dying. So naturally it's one of the first places where they start grafting. Yeah. And those vines seem to be going going strong and even still popping out rootstock shoots. Okay, good. Uh, someone else has asked, where is your vineyard? It's Grenache, I think, isn't it? I presume it's in the Barossa, isn't it? But where oh, in the Barossa? Tick and tick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's old vine Grenache. It's in the Barossa. It's on deep sand in a little subregion called uh, Vine Vale. Okay, somebody said in the Leon Valley, uh, hundred year old Chenin vines grafted onto rootstocks, grafted onto rupestris. Yeah, there we go, yeah, Derek, uh, my good friend Derek, a, from, a from distinguished one. winemaker from from Chile. Maoli, they, a lot of Derek's stuff is, and and also what other producers are doing is to graft onto old pais. Uh, and some of those mm -hmm. Pais roots are at least 100 years old. I mean, Derek maybe can tell us um, how much of a paper trail there is for those old vines in 
in Chile where the, where the people actually know when they were planted. There you go, the Mullinews mm -hmm. planted in 1900, South Africa also grafted onto Jacquet. Okay, thank you guys mm -hmm. for your comments. If anybody wants to put any more comments out there, please do. But I think Dylan, you should move on to the, 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 the meat of no, your presentation, sorry. which is the scientific. It, it will be. And uh, great questions. I think we're still exploring how old vines can be. I mean, the oldest noble vine is, what, 480 or something yeah. in Slovenia, in, in Maribor. But anyway, back to my research. So what was the point? Um, I'm preaching to the converted here to say uh, to you guys what the value or what the industry sees as the value of old vines. Old vine fruit and old vine wines are highly valued and highly prized. So this research was intended to try and see if we could use some scientific rigor to get to the bottom of what might be driving some of those perceived quality parameters. Why hasn't this been done before? Well, it's very difficult to set up a study that can stand up to scientific scrutiny when you're using time as the treatment variable. There's I don't think that I could roll up to, you know, roll up to the Freedom Vineyard and pull out every second row and replant a young vine next to it. It just wouldn't happen. <laughs> so uh, having having the correct setup in order to do a scientific trial um, can only be done in a few places around the world. And I know there's one which we may even hear about in future conferences, which is being published in Geisenheim, where they have three age groups planted side by side with Riesling, which is great. But... Here we are in the Broster Valley with own rooted old vines. And if it presented a unique opportunity. So doing a literature review of, of any study that mentioned vine age, even if it wasn't the principal reason why the study was being undertaken, I managed to find uh, a number of studies. Now, two of these, one is from 2018 down the bottom and one is from 2021, have only recently been added. In terms of the findings, it's really hard to find, uh, to have conclusive findings when we're dealing with different climates, varieties, training methods. There's a whole lot of variables, which made it a challenge. The average age difference of all the combined studies that had been undertaken up until now was 26 years between the youngest and oldest finds that they were comparing. Whereas in the Barossa Valley, we have such a rich resource of very old vines that we were able to go through a dozen sites and filter out ones that maybe weren't healthy or were showing a little bit of virus or had too much wood disease, which I know was an issue in the Riesling study, and find healthy, healthy vineyards where they had an old vine, some up to 170 years in age, and they had taken cuttings or they had vegetatively propagated young vines very close by in similar soil with similar management, but the same genetic material. Now that's the important key. Now, what makes this study or this opportunity special is the fact that the average age difference that we had between our study cohort, cohort between old and young vines was 98 years. So 98 years difference between the young and the old vines, uh, which is um, pretty, pretty extraordinary and a unique opportunity. Where were the vines? For those of you that don't know the Barossa Valley, this is this brown or maroon or whatever colour this region is here. This is the Barossa Valley, which is known as the Valley Floor, which is generally, it's, it's Mediterranean, but it's warm and arid. So I had three sites in Barossa Valley, two sites just up the hill in Eden Valley, which is at a higher elevation and is can be two to three degrees cooler during summer days, but it is known to be cooler and a little bit wetter. So that's the spread of the study sites. Where do we start? Well, the past, site, the past studies gave us some clues, but we really went on a, on a fishing expedition and took a shotgun approach. So it meant that I had a whole room full of supervisors and a whole lot of scientific disciplines that I needed to wrap my head around. But we looked at everything from canopy growth, uh, yield and pruning parameters. We looked at fruit, basic berry chemistry, berry sensory analysis, more complex berry chemistry. Wines were made in a, a standardised small batch method from each of the sample plots for both young and old over three years, which underwent full analysis. 
including sensory and metabolomic. And then the uh, pushing the envelope a little bit further, we also did genetic analysis and also epigenetic, looking at cytosine methylation. So epigenetic analysis on these young and old vines. So what do we come up with? If I jump straight in, in terms of vine performance, it was actually quite interesting because the things that we were, that people were saying, oh, you're going to find out old vines have got smaller berries and old vines yield less because they're really unhealthy. We didn't find that in this study. In fact, this, these, these bar charts here, if you look at the stars, they're where there is a statistical, statistically significant difference between old and young. Now, there's a scientific study, so I'll keep going back to statistical significance because for publishing, I needed to assign a p-value and it needed to stand up to some, some rigour. So yeah, I will be mentioning that a little bit. So fruit mass at a standardised kilograms per metre, the old vines had greater fruit mass, greater bunch number, greater bunch mass and greater berry number per bunch. So they were more reproductive, more successful in terms of their reproductive capacity in terms of their berry number and seed number. Um, does, does that mean bunch that, size as well? Sorry to interrupt. Is that bunch size as well as berry number? Yeah, if bunch yeah. size is made up by the number of berries yeah. and yeah, the mass of those berries. Well, I mean, I mean num number of bunches as well as bunch size, yeah? Yes, yeah. bunch number up here per metre yeah. is greater and berry number per bunch was also greater. Okay, thank you. But the important thing or the interesting thing was we found no difference in individual berry mass between the young and the old, which often comes up as, as, as a point of difference in conversations. When it came to looking at how these vines were more successfully, in more successful in terms of their reproductive capacity, we thought, well, what could be driving that? And that reproductive capacity and early shoot growth and flowering is supported by carbohydrate storage. So we looked at the physical size of the vines and no surprises here is that the younger vines in terms of their trunk circumference was much smaller than the older vines. Obviously as a vine age, it builds on its, on its cellular levels and it builds tissue out and gets bigger and bigger. So this increased girth corresponds to an increased storage capacity of carbohydrate which the older vines can then draw on and what we see above ground is also potentially replicated below ground didn't get the green light to dig up any old vines in this study but if anyone's out there um, but we we can infer that perhaps the increased capacity of the old vines is, is related in some way to its carbohydrate storage reserves that's the vegetative measures aside. If we go on to fruit and wine composition, so we looked at basic grape chemistry and the snapshot was there were no real clear differences between vine age. One thing that was consistent that's come up in earlier studies and it's also come up in the newest old vine study, which was published in 2021 on Zinfandel, is that Old vines at uh, sugar maturity or sugar ripeness, whatever you call it, whatever you'd like to call it, have a uh, lower pH and a higher TA, so better properties for wine making. But this translated into wine chemistry measures, which saw few age differences. These were standardised wine making in wine making in small batches. So we didn't see many age differences there, but we did see site discrimination in terms of the chemistry, which I'll show you some plots of that. We took a step further in looking at tannin composition, which again didn't separate the vines based on their age category, but it did highlight site differences and also sub-regional differences, which some of these compositional measures have been used to, to identify differences within sub-regions or within vineyards before. So that, that wasn't new either. Just one second, yep. there, there is a question, and I think we should probably deal with it quickly now, because it's interesting, from Jaco Engelbrecht yep. saying, could higher bunch oh, mass yeah. and bunch amounts, can you see that be due to more arms and bearers on the older vines? Yeah. 
and also on the older vines, you would have more space for light to penetrate the basal, the basal, basal eyes. How do you, what do you call that? Basal eyes? I don't know. Or, or what? Yeah, the, ba the basal nodes for greater fruitfulness because yeah. fruitfulness is um, is derived from the sunlight infiltration at flowering for the following year. So Yako's on a thread there. And um, yeah. we standardized the measurements. So per meter, the, the vine still had greater fruitfulness. But what you've you've kind of hit the nail on the head, Yako, and, and you've pointed out that it's related to the capacity. So the more arms, yes, the more space, yes, the more carbohydrates, yes, which is a vine capacity measure. Okay, one, one other question. Somebody just said, were, were these grafted? We, these are all ungrafted vines because we're in South Australia, which has no phylloxera. And although people, as you said, would graft sometimes for nematode resistance, but these are all these are all ungrafted vines you're studying, aren't they? These are all ungrafted vines, and some of them predate, you know, the the invention of grafting because that was obviously born out of necessity in the 1800s. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Well, th there's another question that we'll come back to in a minute from Elisma, but let's keep let's keep going with this bit. All right. Let's do this. Now we're going to get heavy. All right. If you haven't seen these before, this is a principal component analysis. I'm going to show you a few more of these. And basically, inside of this this square box, each of these colours represents a site, and the different shapes. I put a label on it so we can tell the different shapes are if they're old and young. Now the this one is sensory analysis. So attributes that were seen to be statistically uh, significantly different between old and young over three consecutive seasons made it onto this chart. Now, if we see a grouping of sites, for example, if we had three sites in the top corner over here and two sites down in the bottom corner, we would say that they have, they're showing good separation and we would look at what attributes, these little dots, are driving that separation. So that's the explanation and we jump in. So in terms of sensory analysis, old vine berries consistently showed um, greater uh, sensation of pulp acidity and skin acidity compared to younger vine berries. And also were, they had attributes relating to astringency and tongue movement after after spitting out the berry pulp whereas the younger vine berries were more associated with a sweetness so a pulp sweetness and dried fruit flavors now this is on this principal component the vertical one which represents 36 percent of the variation in the data set if we jump over and say right let's look at this first principal component that represents a greater 44 percent of the data set I can put a circle around and show you that these two sites, old and young, and these remaining sites are in different parts of the Barossa Valley. So what we actually saw is some difference for age, but a greater difference relating to the terroir or where the vines were grown. Could, could you just very quickly for people who don't know the Barossa, just say how much cooler the Eden Valley is than, these, than some of these valley floor sites? Okay, so the Eden Valley has an elevation, say, 300 to 600 metres, a mean January temperature of around 19 degrees Celsius, whereas the Barossa Valley, which is lower and has elevations 130 to, say, 300 metres, um, has a mean January temperature of around 21 degrees. So a mean temperature difference of two degrees, but that can translate to quite a few more degrees during the peak of, of summer. And also in the Eden Valley, we'll see a greater diurnal fluctuation. So the nights will be cooler due to the elevation and only parts of the Barossa will, will benefit from the, the catabatic or the draining of that cool air out of the Eden Valley into the Lowen Valley floor. Thank you. So, of course, once we crushed those berries and made wine, we did wine sensory descriptive analysis. And this, again, represents three years of data that was statistically significant comparing old and young. It was great. I did the first year's analysis and we had these great, it was great examples, great old and young, they're very different. Put in the next year and they got closer together. Put in the third year and they got closer together again. I, I wanted so many times during the study to have old over here and young over here and it to be simple, <laughs> but it, it wasn't the case. 
But digging, digging into this, we saw consistency in old vine wines showing greater fresh fruit and red fruit characters and younger vines, younger vine wine showing more dark fruit, savoury and mouthfeel associated characters. It's difficult to see, but if I explain it to you that each of these, each of the sites, so each of the young vine wine wines, the old vine wine from the same site was always higher on this vertical principle, principle component. So from this site, the old vine is higher, yellow, higher, green, higher. They're all, even though they're mixed up and they're not separating, the old vines, the old vine wines have this this attribute. Which, um, which attribute do you mean? The freshness? The freshness. freshness and red fruit. Yes, yeah. freshness and, and red fruit. Yeah. Whereas, and the receiving um, system is the opposite, don't you think? Yeah, you would think, you might think so. But then it depends on how people are going to make their wines because these wines were made in exactly the same way. But if these wines were picked and sent to a cellar, you know, the old vine wines might get the best oak and the best treatment and the best fermenters. Yeah. We, we should just add that the, these are all Shiraz and these are all made in the same vintage. You're comparing vintage with vintage and, and site with site. That's the point, isn't it? I'm comparing three consecutive vintages here. Somebody yep. asked the question. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Great. Sorry. And yes, they were all made in small batch, 20 kilogram ferments, and they were all quite successful because anyone that's tried to do a small batch ferment would know that that can be a challenge. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Some of the things through the middle, like length of aftertaste and fruit aftertaste, because they're near the middle here, there wasn't a real difference between old and young. Um, we looked at tannin composition so not just total tannins because with one of those earlier slides i said total tannins didn't have a didn't have a great bearing or there wasn't a great difference between old and young but looking at the composition of the components of the tannins and the ratios or the degree of polymerization of the tannin subunits we thought this might show a bit of difference but and this was even harder to tell the difference we couldn't we couldn't separate old and young here but what we could do again of course was separate based on the subregion. so the cooler and wetter eden valley had a tannin composition that was more unique than the lower warmer Barossa valley so so the sub-regional difference was was more significant than the vine age really in this case yes yeah. for tannin yeah. composition yeah. correct thank you we took the tannin composition me measures and we also did some very targeted chromatography mass spec measurements also to, to have a look if there was an alignment with what was seen for the sensory part of the study. And here we saw some agreement. Some of these, these random numbers are features that we didn't identify, so they were unidentified, but they're not driving the separation north and south on this plot. The major separation between subregions is, if we say east and west or left and right, 52% of the variability. A lot of it's driven by these compounds, quercetin and camphorol. Now, quercetin is very well known. It's a, it's a precursor for anthocyanin synthesis, and it's, it's associated with hotter and drier climates. So it's associated with sunshine. So it's not surprising that this was driving the valley floor sensory profiles. And we know that these both of these compound, compounds have sensory outcomes, as we can see again here. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause there before I there get into two, the molecular two, part. Couple, couple, of, couple of questions, and just one thing I'd like to ask you. One is said, Elisma van Weingart is saying, the young vineyards used are still quite old. How do you think it would compare to very young vines from 10 to 20 years old? Do you think there would be a significant difference? I think potentially, but we had some, we had some vineyards. If I, if you could bear with me, boom, 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 we've got the numbers back here. You know, the relative age differences are quite broad compared to what people often talk about in media. I mean, here, six-year-old vines versus 93-year-old vines, 12-year-old yeah. versus 128. I mean, that's a it's a pretty it's a pretty big gap. So some of these, what might be an argument against the study, is that 
these are approaching, this one is classed as an old vine. Yeah. If you look at the Barossa Valley Charter, and I think some other ones around the world, 35 is 35 old. South Africa, yeah. Yeah, exactly, which I'm over 35 and I'm not old. Um, <laughs> probably not the same for vines either. But uh, anyway, that's, a, that's another story. And there's another question from Laura Katina, who's going to be with us in a minute. Right. Are the old vines in the Barossa irrigated and do you use drip irrigation? Some of the old vines are irrigated and yes, it is drip irrigation. So this is one of the sites. You can see the tube going along here. This is another site that was dry grown. All of these sites, so the irrigation wasn't controlled in this study, but because these vines have such significant age, in terms of the regional average for irrigation, these guys, if they're irrigated at all, get minimal, minimal irrigation. Okay, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that's blown me away about your research is this question of yield. I mean, one of the reasons why people often argue against old vines and pull them out, indeed, is they argue that they're uneconomic. What you're showing is that, is that I mean, certainly the quality is there, but we knew that in many cases, but that the, mm -hmm. that the yield is there too, that there's not a significant difference. I just wonder, you know, what, what that means for the economics of growing these vineyards. In other words, is, that can, is it easier to persuade growers to keep them in the ground because you can say, well, the yields are fine. I think, yeah, I think we need to, I mean, it's so simplistic to say that older vines have a falling yield, so they become un uneconomical and yeah. we pull them out, unless yeah. they're in a special spot. But I think you need to, oh, being a technical viticulturalist, you need to look into what is the driver of that yield reduction. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes the driver of that yield reduction might be heavy handed pruning so poor pruning it may be that the vines have been running out of space so they've had to cut them back it may be that the soil's getting tired or the water source is no longer suitable i think there's a lot of drivers here all of these vineyards have good or well, you can look at how wide these rows are good space to occupy and they've been cared for some of them through six consecutive generations so they're still in very good health. I mean, this one here gets, this one down here gets a lot of compost and under vine treatment to keep it healthy. So it's a little bit simplistic in some cases to say that it's to do with um, age, the decline. I know in Europe, a lot of decline can be from, from esker or trunk diseases, which don't play a part in, well, esker, not in Australia, but trunk diseases in particular in this growing region are an issue, but are less of an issue with the pruning method and the training and management of these old vines. And de dead arm is a trunk disease, isn't it? Presumably with a name like that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Dead arm is Utipalata, which, which is a, well, it can be Utipa or Botrysphaeria, but either way it gets into your pruning wounds and it yeah. eats its way back through the vine and, and kills off the arm. One more question on maybe on this section before we move on to the third part, which is again from Yako. Do you think irrigation will limit vine age in future due to smaller root structures or more concentrated root structures to be precise? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, yes, unless we irrigate, irrigate in the early years to establish, to establish structural roots deep within the soil and also Yako, I know you're right on to it is pre-planting preparation now none of these sites had a D a D9 or a D10 dozer rip one meter deep through they were just planted in the ground but the drip tube wasn't invented until you know 70 80 90 years after they were originally planted so they did have to survive for quite some time and explore and exploit that soil so yeah, I think with irrigation and with mulching in young vineyards, we need to use caution. Okay, let's move on to the part three, which is your epigenetic analysis, isn't it? All right, how are we going for time? I'm not- uh, We're, we're fine, we've got another, another 10 minutes or so. 15 minutes. Okay, well, yeah. strap yourselves in. So the last, the last part, which was, which was a new field for me and a new field in looking at this sector of, of vine age, was to look at the, to do molecular analysis. So in molecular analysis, we're talking about the, the genetic analysis, so the DNA, but also the epigenetic or the epigenome. So if I explain the difference between the genome and the epigenome first, that's probably a quick, rough, it'll be a rough guide introduction. So 
The genome is the DNA. So the DNA is what's fixed and what's what codes the, the vine or the variety to have all of its um, attributes that we know. Why Chardonnay has a naked pediol sinus or why Shiraz has got oval shaped berries. This DNA was set in place when that first seed was produced and that one vine grew. And then that one Shiraz vine is now all over the world with the same genetic background and the same DNA. There's a lot of other stuff in there because you can imagine vegetative propagation over millennia. Imagine if you didn't move house for a thousand years, you'd accumulate a bit of junk. And so that's all in the gene. <laughs> it's a thousand years. Quite, not, quite, look... not quite 20 <laughs> years of junk. <laughs> okay. Well, the shells look quite orderly. I think you're doing well. But, you should uh, see the rest of it. It's chaos around me. <laughs> okay. Well, don't turn your camera around. Exactly. So, if we think of the think of the DNA as being fixed or conserved, and that's the thing that makes Shiraz Shiraz, you know, Cabernet Cabernet. But if we think of the epigenome or epigenetics, this is a field that looks at the DNA, but epi being above, it's above the DNA. So this DNA codes what a variety will look like and how it will behave and what sort of plasticity it has. But in terms of epigenetic markers, if the DNA is my notebook, for example, an epigenetic marker might be a dog ear that I put over or a, uh, a bookmark that I put in to remember a certain situation so I can go back to it. Plants are sessile, which means they can't move. So they've developed these methods to adapt to their environment, which include epigenetic modification. So there, there are a lot of examples, if you wanna go out and search them, where a stress is placed on a plant and the plant can change its gene expression. The, the book hasn't changed, but the pages that it flips to, that it either expresses over or under expresses, um, can be changed based on the epigenetic markers. This has been proven where if a plant is exposed to a stress, it then changes its epigenetic profile. And the next time it sees that stress, it stresses less. So these changes are cumulative, they're heritable, but they're also reversible. So hopefully I explain that kind of okay. I used to, that was spot on, I thought. Really interesting, right. the idea of the, of the mark in a, in, a, in a book, yeah? Yeah, I think it's just the simplest way for me to probably, you know, geneticists or proper yeah. <laughs> molecular biologists and pointing out all the errors, but it'll do for this for this talk. <laughs> we looked, I said that the, the Shiraz all came, all the Shiraz in the world came from one seed, and I did genetic analysis on this cohort of old and young, and there was no structure in the data set, so they were all Shiraz. But then we went one step further and we sliced up our, our molecular analysis and our DNA extraction and treatment to look at methylation profiles of the samples. Now, if we look at this plot here, first we look at the dendrogram on the left. This is just a tree of relatedness, really, between the samples. So this is site five, if you can read it or not, site five, old and young closely related, but the whole site is a long way off from the rest of the sites in the study. Here, down in this branch, we've got site one and two. The old and young for each site are, are still quite closely related to each other, but each site doesn't have a close relationship, but it has a closer relationship than five or three and four. Now, three and four is where it gets interesting because these guys have the greatest separation in age and the oldest vines in the study. Now here we can see the old vines start to group together and the young vines have a closer association to each other than the old vines. So we're seeing some signals of this, this, this epigenetic relationships based on age. So, so you could say the, the, same, older vine, the older vines have more bookmarks as it were, yeah? Maybe they've got more experience, yes. Yeah. We saw a lot more, we, I refer to them as DMM, so differentially methylated markers. Yeah. As the vines got older, so the oldest vines were stacked with loads of DMMs. Yeah. The next youngest vine had a few and then a few less, and it really ramped up quite a lot. Unfortunately, we didn't study enough vines. I mean, having five sites, it would be great to have 100 sites and see where that point of experience really starts to take off, which may indicate where a vine is no longer juvenile. But that's that's for someone else to study. Uh, this, yeah. 
This little colourful plot down here is the same the same thing, but a different representation. So the discriminating factor here is age. And what we see here is that old and young are all kind of mixed up together, but we again see an epigenetic link to Tewar between the Barossa and the Eden Valley sites. And we've got this random outlier sitting up on the top here, which is also the one over this other side, which was on its own. So what makes this site stand alone. When we looked at the data, thought, what's going on here? It was a bit of a head scratching moment until it turned into an aha moment. You remember I said, the important thing is all these vines are genetically identical. The daughter vine came from the old mother vine. Now of the five sites, four of them were propagated from cuttings taken, calloused in a callous bed or anywhere and planted in the ground as a unique, as a, well, a clone, but an individual vine. That was the first four sites. Site five, this site that's on its own over here was propagated by a layering whereby you take a shoot from the mother vine, which an example here is the mother. You intentionally take a shoot, put it underground, it adventitiously roots and you grow a daughter vine. Now, here you can see that the umbilical cord is thinner in diameter than the trunk of the daughter vine. So this daughter vine is actually starting to stand on its own. But during the early days of establishment, which in these old vineyards, it's highly competitive and there's roots everywhere because they've been there for 100 plus years. Mm. Planting a single vine can be tricky. So layering is often a technique that is used where the mother and daughter are related. Now, in old vineyards without trellises as well, this can be unintentional. So here is an example where the arm is bent over and touches the ground and it's formed its own root so it's also now got two two root zones to exploit more soil surface and soil pores for both uh, moisture and nutrition so this is how site five was propagated so if i fast forward we then flipped the analysis and didn't go right we're looking for the holy grail of old and young let's use that as a discriminating factor let's look at propagation type as the discriminating factor so when we did that we got this dendrogram. And the results, if I go straight over here, we saw that the cuttings from all of the old vines up here were grouped with a similar profile. All of the young vines that were clonally propagated group over here, but there is separation between old and young based on their differentially methylated markers. But down here, site five that was layered and then cut severed from the mum so they were only together for the first five years and then they were independent vines were inseparable based on their epigenetic profile so, so the, the young vine even when it's separated inherits the characteristics of the old vine yeah the, the, the epi, epigenetic characteristics would that be correct that would be spot on so it's it's seen in some other crops but we we well we propose that what happens is when you take the cutting from the mother vine, mm. it's just an independent stick. It doesn't know which way's up, which way's down. It needs to form a callus. It yeah. needs to revert to a juvenile state and not put out a bunch and just focus on putting out leaves like cuttings do. So as it does that, it most likely loses all its epigenetic marks or its epigenetic memory that it was carrying from the mother. So it truly becomes juvenile. Whereas when it was layered, we didn't see that. And I don't have the results in here, but I did a little side study where I did the same thing. I got the same vine, yeah. I layered it, and I took a cutting, and I took um, a sample of the mother, the daughter, the cutting, mother and, mother and daughter, of course, they were connected. They're exactly the same vine, but the cutting, completely different. Epigenetic profile, but genetically identical. How, how so, fascinating, yeah. That was, that, was, that was a really interesting piece uh, to come across. And another little tidbit to say that all of these sites up here, this is almost a, a map of um, how these vineyards are harvested. All of the old vine vineyards are harvested separately for a particular product. All of the young vine vineyards are harvested for a particular product and labelled as such. Whereas this vineyard in the bottom, because it's layered, there's an old vine a layer and a young vine. So the, the vineyard down the row has got old, young, old, young, young, old, 
they're all interplanted essentially, which messed with a lot of my stats earlier on. In the and, piece. And how, how economically viable is layering? Is it just a, just a, a means of filling in dead vines in an old vineyard, or is it something that could have a broader application? I think I think what I've what I've discovered here, if you just let me finish that sure. down that row, the yeah. winemaker doesn't go in and pick the young vine and the old vine separately. They consider that the fruit from the old and the young is of equal quality or the young vines don't detract enough from the old vine. So it goes into an old vine product. Okay. Yeah. And they have the same profile. So to your point, it is absolutely viable. And in some cases, it's the only way to replicate own rooted old vineyards because yeah. of the or without supplementary irrigation yeah, I mean, Derek so a lot saying, of vineyards have got irrigation but there'll only be a dripper yeah. where there's a new planting yeah i mean in chile and argentina this is these are called mugarones and 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 as derek said this is how vineyards been maintained and filled in for hundreds of years so it, it's, an, mm -hmm. it's an old technique that you know they didn't have your analysis but they could see the result in the glass and in the vineyard really yeah, I mean, you get you get some. I mean, I saw some in in Catalonia where there was one vine, two, sometimes three vines. Peter uh, Stoltman in California is propagating an entire vineyard that's going to be from one mother vine. There's going to be thousands. They've already got thousands of individual yeah. vines, and they're layering the entire yeah. place. Okay, thank you. Um, You're saying very economically viable, uh, way cheaper than interplanting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Completely, with with other upside benefits, yeah. um, if you don't have the lobster. <laughs> so, if we if we wrap it up, so we still got some questions. Old vines, it's complicated. That's me digging amongst the old vines, and we need to keep digging because what this study has shown is that there are some some threads that we can still chase, mm. because I don't think it's conclusive, and as a study, it if you do end up reading the end or the last chapter, there's some really interesting pieces that can be picked up and can be researched or can advance this, this field. Yeah. Real quick, age is complex, it's linked to terroir. The finer the resolution of the measurement, be it on our palate or with really sophisticated techniques, we're able to separate old and young better than basic measurements. When I applied really strict statistic rigor on them, it was more difficult, but it was possible. And there needs to be some, some future research in this field, which I know there's some coming out of Germany and some coming out of Napa, which is, which is really exciting. So I couldn't have done it without all of my, my PhD scholarship and friends in the lab. So thanks to them. And hopefully I haven't burned all the time or bored you to tears. No, no, I, I, on, the, on the contrary. And, and we, we, it should also say, you're too modest to say so, but you got a distinction for this, for your PhD work. So you can see why. I think it's an amazing piece of work. One, one question, which is very interesting, we didn't get onto, was the whole thing of climate change. Someone said, uh, is it true that old vines, because they've seen more vintages, more climatic conditions, are better suited to climate change? Is this because of epigenetics? Was a question from Dennis. Then I'd say yes, if they're already old. The longer they're in the <laughs> ground, <laughs> the longer they're in the ground, the more opportunity they've got to adapt to their site, which is why older vines, you know, once they're no longer juvenile, they, they produce um, wines that are unique because they've adapted to the site within a certain band. You can't go poking them too hard and turn off the water and go, you will survive because yeah. they won't. There's only a, there's a limit to the plasticity. But to answer the question, I think uh, yes is the answer because some of these vines here, they've been through droughts. Maybe they went through a drought in the 20s. They went through like a 10 year drought and were like, damn, that was so hot and so dry. Then we hit 2009 and it's hot and dry and they're like hey i remember 2000 i remember the 1920s and that was a killer summer and they stress less the study out of napa showed that the photosynthetic rates of older vines was reduced compared to younger vines younger vines more anisohydric so they're like a puppy they're going to run all day and then fall over whereas perhaps with vine age i'd be interested to see more from this study but perhaps the older vines become more water pessimists more isohydric yeah. and with greater carbohydrate and more root potential root area and soil to exploit. Thank you. Two other quick questions and I think we should move on to Laura. Right. Can you comment on dendrochronology? I can. 
And if my emails would answer, I'd have a better answer. I'd have you, a better I answer. You better, you. you better explain to us, though, for those of us who aren't scientists, what dendrochronology is, please, quickly. Dendrochronology is basically measuring tree rings. Vines are not trees, they're lianas. They yeah. have uh, tendrils to hold themselves up, so they don't have heartwood. So it's a challenge to measure the age of some of these old vines because some of these old vines that are 180 years old don't have a full trunk, so they won't have all of their rings. Dendrochronology is microscopically looking at how many cell layers or how many layers were added on yeah. annually to age a vine. Okay, thank you very much. One other question is how do you layer when the vines are so tall, as in your previous photograph? Oh, it's a multi-year process, <laughs> and I think it's a good thing. It's a good question to ask, but the other question is, how the hell do you lay a mataro or Grenache or really erect <laughs> varieties that don't even want to bend over? You, you need to prune to a downward-facing bud, and then when you get the shoot coming out when it's green, you can pin it to the ground or get it to grow down before it lignifies. And sometimes it might take two or three years to get far enough away from the mother and long enough to get underground. Okay. So it nice. takes a Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, that was amazing. It really was. And thank you for sharing your research with us. Thank you for the interesting questions and also the comments, everybody, that they've made. Absolutely outstanding. Dylan, if you could unshare your presentation and we're going to move on to Laura. Sarah, back to you for a second. Great. Thank you so much. And Dylan, I wanted to very quickly ask you, as I started researching old vines, it's taken me into the world of current arguments about pruning. And I wanted to ask you whether you think that uh, all the kind of, if you like, the orthodoxy of how to prune, which is essentially a kind of a crippling operation, I've noticed that these are being challenged and questioned, and it seems to have been driven by the research into old vines. Do you think we're looking at a real different shift in, in how we think about tending vines and, and allowing them to get healthy and old, stay healthy and get old? Yes. I mean, as a, as a vigneron and as a consultant that works with you know, so many amazing people in amazing vineyards, absolutely. Pruning is the key operation that can, well, you can set, you always say you can set a vineyard back a number of years with one poor pruning season. But I think with the current interest in pruning, definitely it's going to help help vineyards have less large wounds and less perhaps less trunk disease but less scars but if we go back and look at some of the oldest vineyards that there are my very first slides I said they could occupy space what leads to bad pruning is people making big cuts to try and cut these vines back and put them in a box if we let them go maybe they can live a long time I'm really interested to see what Nayan's going to talk about in Bolivia because those vines I don't think are pruned terribly hard and if I think back to the first pruning lesson I got, um, it was on 100, well, they were 100, yeah, 100 year old Shiraz vines. And it was old, an old German guy teaching me and his, his rules stick today. Before there was a hashtag, his rules still would have a hashtag about respecting the flow, you know, spurs below canes, outward facing buds, never cut old wood. And that's also why I think we see a lot of old vines that are bush vines because bush vine pruning by default always is gentle. You're pruning to only one two-year-old wood. You're pruning to outward facing buds to maintain a good structure and you're building on that living wood. Even in, our, even in the logo, you can see that. Whereas, you know, modern guyo or modern pruning has kind of ignored some of those some of those aspects which we're now coming back to so yeah you'll hear a lot more about the effect of of pruning and looking carefully at at old vines at where they've got their lifeblood before you make that cut fantastic thank you so much it's been an amazing presentation and uh, what we will do i'm conscious there are a few questions actually i can see still coming in dylan i'll follow up with you if that's okay and send you some of the questions that have come in so we can pick up on those online absolutely and i'll jump on the chat too for a bit more uh, a bit more back and thank forth thank you thank you so much you're an absolute star and as they say keep grigging <laughs> oh nice i like that i like that too <laughs>